Okay, great. We moved it. So um, I'll just be honest. Like this word is really fresh. Even like a few days ago, I was like, God, I had to go back to this word and apply it. So it's like really fresh. So I may cry. It's okay if you're afraid of tears. Um, I will try to make it as less, as least amount of awkward as I can. But I just want to say that we've been talking about breakthrough all summer, about a God of breakthrough. And if you are the person that's been waiting for a breakthrough, this message is for you. If you're to the point with that thing that it's been so hard to hold on to hope, this message is for you. If you're like, God, unless you show up and do this, I'm done. This message is for you. And I want you to close your eyes because it's not going to be anything that I say that's going to bring the breakthrough. It's him. It's Jesus. And I just want to, I just, if that is you, maybe you're like, I'm not waiting for a thing. Like God gave it to me last week and it's awesome. Yes, we celebrate that. But I'm telling you, eventually there's going to be that thing that you have to wait for, that you have to put all your faith that will like strip you of everything you are just to believe that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. There's going to be that time when there's that thing in your life. And so as you take that breakthrough, that promise, that word that God has given, I want you to fix your eyes on Jesus right now. Jesus, if you notice, there was this tenderness that came in the room, like his tenderness came in the room when we worshiped. And I just ask Jesus that you would tenderize our hearts. We fix our eyes on you. You're the author. You're the perfecter of our faith. Our whole life is for you. You're the one that brings the breakthrough. And we just invite you to move in Jesus' name. And if he's touching you throughout the night, please just, if he starts speaking to you and taking you into something, just let him do it. I believe he's going to move I believe he's going to speak. So we've been talking about breakthrough. That was a word that growing up in non-charismatic Christian church, I didn't ever hear the word breakthrough. I don't know about y'all. Is that a term that you grew up hearing? Like breakthrough. I didn't. Um, about in 2015, I went actually to Redding, California. There's a church called Bethel, and there's a ministry school called BSSM. And I remember my first day was, um, we, we picked up our books, it was our registration day. You think registration, first day of school, you're going to just go get your binder, pick up your books, like meet some people, take a picture, and it's going to be awesome, and you're going to start the year. Well, that's not what this was like. <laughs> so I, I go upstairs to meet my pastor for the year, and like, the third year interns that are in their third year of school. And I see this woman, which I didn't think she was strange because I just had coffee with her the week before and she was normal. Like she totally read my mail and I was like, how did she do that? She doesn't know me. Like, how did she tell me all these things about my life? Maybe she hears God, but she's normal. But when I went, um, when I went up to register, I saw her praying over students and she was screaming like, breakthrough. And people were like, ah, uh, falling on the floor. And I was like, God, you put me in the wrong group. Like, I really thought about hiding and like going to another group. Cause I was like, I don't know what she's doing. And I don't know what that is. Well, I remember she prayed for every student, which is actually really special. There was like 60 of us. And as she prayed over me, I remember, um, she started praying for breakthrough. And I was like, break, she's like, breakthrough. Take it, Trina, take it. And I'm thinking, I'm taking it. <laughs> I'm taking it, please, Lord. Show me how to take it. Like, and she kept saying, breakthrough, take it. 
And I was like, God, show me what I got to do to take it because I must not be doing it right because she keeps saying it. (laughs) And there came a point where I was like, she's like, took my hands and she said, Trina, Jesus wants to give you a gift and all you have to do is reach up and take it. And as soon as I fixed my eyes on Jesus and I yielded, I just received from him. And I feel like tonight, God's going to bring breakthrough. And for those that want to receive, that's how you do it. You just yield. You don't have to strive. You don't have to do anything. You just say, thank you, Lord. And you receive it. So Angela actually, every week we would meet in a group of 60, and there were like 1,500 people in our big class But I learned this word breakthrough was something that she carried. I learned that breakthrough was something she went after every week in our group. I even learned that there were times when angels came and ministered and there was an angel of breakthrough that when the angel came in the room, we were just undone by like the goodness of God and whatever it was in our heart that was keeping us stuck He touched that spot and breakthrough came every single time. And I've been praying tonight that he would do that tonight. I believe he's going to do that tonight. So when when I'm thinking about uh, breakthrough, you know, Kanal last two weeks ago talked about there's different types. There's a type that comes. I can't remember the words he used. Don't tell him I said that. But instant breakthrough. And then I think he said progressive breakthrough. Okay. Yes. I've experienced some instant breakthrough. How many people have experienced some instant breakthrough? But like tonight, um, what I'm talking about is that breakthrough that's progressive that breakthrough that you have to wait for, the breakthrough that you have to wrestle with, that causes a tension in your heart, that leaves you in a place where you're desperate for God, where you realize that there's nothing in your own effort that can bring it about. That thing that God uses to shape and refine your heart and your character, that's what I'm talking about. So if there's a promise that you've kind of shelved because it's been too painful, that's the promise I'm talking about. If there's a promise that you're like, I don't even know how to believe for this anymore because I've been so disappointed over and over, that's what I'm talking about. That's what he wants to touch. It is James 1. Uh, two through four, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of any kind, because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I'm starting to believe there are certain breakthrough and promises that he uses for that. So you will not lack anything. So we will be made mature and look like Christ. So I was listening to Bill Johnson because over the last couple months, for those that have known me, I went through a lot of emotional sadness. And so I was searching. So this message is coming out of like months of just wrestling and sadness that I didn't know what to do with because I don't know about y'all, but I'm like on inside out, you know, sadness. I'm like, she's cute, but like, get away from me. I don't like you. I don't want to be sad. Uh, I want to be happy and go do something fun all the time. Like, I don't want to sit around in sadness. So I was listening to Bill Johnson and he said, um, he was reading out of Matthew 13. I'm just kind of jumping around. There's just a few different scriptures that I felt like God wanted me to... It was in the parable of the sower, and he said, in the kingdom, when a word of the Lord is spoken over your life, it will attract conflict. 
He said, in the kingdom, when a, the word of the Lord is spoken over your life, when a promise is spoken over your life, it will attract conflict. Where did he get that from? Well, he got it from Matthew 13, 21, the parable of the sower. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, because of the word, he quickly falls away. Not if trouble or persecution, when trouble or persecution comes because of the word. And he said, if you don't understand that conflict is going to come when a word of the Lord is spoken over your life, then you're going to think that you've done something wrong when you're waiting. That you're going to think that you haven't done something right, and that's why you're waiting. Did that hit anyone like it hit me when I first heard it? I was like, I should have known this a long time ago. But he said, when you understand, then you position yourself for vindication. You position yourself for vindication. Tonight, God is positioning us for vindication. I like tried to write. I tried to do an outline of my outline and it just is not working. (laughs) So... um, I was in that boat of thinking the breakthrough I've been waiting for, it could be, I'll be honest, for me, it's everyone that knows me in here knows me, knows what it is. It's it's a spouse and starting a family. But for you, it might be a family member that doesn't know the Lord. For you, it might be God's told you you're going to have a baby and you haven't had a baby. For you, it might be like God's promised this kind of calling on my life and I haven't seen it come yet or this gift. Um restoration in my marriage, restoration in relationships, whatever it is. That's the thing I'm talking about. So in this season of trying to understand like the sifting that he's doing in my heart, this is something that he told me. He said, Trina, it's my job to bring the breakthrough and it's your job to steward your heart. That's it. He said, it's my job to bring the breakthrough And it's your job to steward your heart while you wait. And I was like, oh, okay. Okay. I don't have to strive. I don't have to work up in my own effort to try to make something happen. Because let me tell you, I've tried and it doesn't work. (laughs) It doesn't work. When you are like going after God's best and that word that God spoke over your life that's so tender and so personal, you can't bring it about in your own strength. And so my friend Chris shared this scripture that I'm like, oh, thank you, Lord. This is a scripture to line up. Do you all ever like have God tell you stuff and you're like, I don't even know if this is biblically biblically scriptural. (laughs) Can I share this? I don't know. Okay. Yeah. So Psalm 37, this is in the New King James Version, three through five. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring it to pass. To pass. So the Lord is like, Trina, it's my job to bring the breakthrough. I'm going to bring it to pass. I just want you to steward your heart while you wait. And when you steward your heart, you're going to steward your belief system because your heart's going to show you what you started to have when you started to partner with a lie, when you started to have unbelief, like your heart's going to show you that. So when you steward your heart, you'll steward your beliefs. When you steward your beliefs, your emotions will automatically come into alignment with what you believe. It's just like a byproduct of what you believe. So in the waiting, I've learned, I'm just going to share, like, these are just some things God's taught me. Again, I'm no Bible scholar, but there are two traps that I feel like the enemy has used as I wait, as we wait. He'll do everything he can to get you to doubt who God is. Everything. Maybe God really didn't tell you that. Maybe God's withholding from you. Maybe God's going to do that for everyone else, but I'm sorry for you. He's not. Maybe he's not really that good, or maybe it's because you've angered him or you've disappointed him, so he's not going to show up for you. It's just like what he did 
with Adam and Eve in the garden, he's like, did God really say, did God really say, if he can get you to doubt what God said, he can get you off track of really going after that thing. He can get you stuck going round and round and round the mountain. So that's one of the um, tricks that he uses. And I was thinking, I was reading in Galatians 3. I'm going to go there for a second and read this because I'm like, God, show me. Do you know why the enemy tries so hard to get us to doubt God, to get us to doubt what he said, to get us to doubt his goodness? Well, I feel like he showed me Galatians 3, starting with verse 2. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Have you suffered so much for nothing? If it really was for nothing... Does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe what you heard? Are you trying to attain your goal by human effort? Does God give his spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe what you heard? This is why I think the enemy goes so strong at trying to get you to doubt what you know you heard from God. Because it's about what we believe. Consider Abraham, he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So the second lie, the second trap, is that he will do everything he can to get you to doubt your identity. He will do everything he can to get you to doubt that you really are who God says you are. And that's where stewarding our heart requires us to, like, be required me to be aware of those lies. And so then I could just repent and I could just rebuke them. And then I could receive the truth. So those were the first couple things. He just showed me like, there's some traps, Trina, that you keep getting stuck in. And these are the traps. And then this is how you get out of the traps. You just like, you know, disagree, renounce the lie. And then you receive the truth. I'm like, okay, I'm one of those. I always think it's me till the Lord or someone's like, actually, that's the enemy. I'm like, oh, okay, good. (laughs) Because... I must be just really messed up all the time. (laughs) Okay, so these are just some things that I've learned kind of over the course of my waiting, but specifically in the the past couple months. And again, the first one is, is about pain, and it's about grief. And nobody probably likes to talk about it, because I don't like to talk about it. But a couple of weeks, like months ago, um, it's like, I was so close to the promise, and then it was like, pop, not yet. And I was like devastated to the point where I was like, God, all this pain's coming up, and I don't know why. And I don't know how to make it stop. And I don't know when it's ever going to stop. And I feel kind of embarrassed because it won't stop because I'm the happy person. And I don't like to be the sad person. And it was a very uncomfortable time. And so after years and years of praying and believing for the thing that you're waiting for, sometimes you might feel sad. Sometimes you might have hope deferred. Sometimes you might cry. You might have pain. There might be a feeling of grief or loss at this thing that hasn't happened yet. And you need to know that it's okay. It's okay to process that and it's okay to have that. And God is not Like, that's too much for me. Like, I found that God pressed into me in those moments that felt so raw and tender. And he would do that for you. Um, It's kind of like the pain I was feeling was the pain of waiting. I don't know if anyone can resonate. The pain of the now and not yet. The pain of sowing tears. The pain of tensions in the kingdom. 
the pain of perseverance. Like I said, I felt like it would never end. So I started reading books on pain. I was like, all right, I'm going to read books on pain. I'm going to fix this. Whatever this is, we're going to fix it, Lord. Let's dig in. Let's repent. Let's forgive. Let's turn from sin. Let's do whatever we need to do to get this taken care of. (laughs) I mean, you know? Okay. Well, C.S. Lewis has a couple books on pain that are kind of hard for me to understand, but you might understand them better. But there is one about on his book, A Grief Observed. I wanted to share a little bit because this part actually the Lord used. Um, it's about his wife dying, and it's really sad. But I love that he's really raw in this book about his emotions. And, you know, sometimes... I found, I don't know about y'all, I'm not saying this church, but growing up as a Christian in the church, I didn't really feel much permission to be sad or much permission to go through a process with God or to wrestle. It was kind of like, come on, just, just have faith. It'll be okay. You know, I felt like if I did struggle, it was like, Trina doesn't have faith. God's not like that. (laughs) Let me just tell you, God's not like that. (laughs) Okay, so, and people just try to help, but they don't know how to help. And I used to be the queen of being uncomfortable with pain and mess until I went to BSSM and everyone was a mess on the floor all the time. And it just became the normal. And so, um, but I was was reading this um, book because even though I haven't lost a spouse, Sometimes it feels like I've lost them because I haven't met them. And I don't know if there's like, put that, your own breakthrough in that category. Maybe it's a physical healing in your body. Maybe it's a mental healing. Um, You know, if if it's been a long time and you've been waiting, you're kind of like, this kind of feels like a loss because I haven't seen this happen. So in this book, after he kind of processed through the pain and the emotions of like, okay, God didn't do this to me because he spites me or hates me. Um, this, is what, this is where he landed after all these emotions. He said, God has not been trying, um, wait, God has not been trying an experiment on my faith or love in order to find out their quality. He knew it already, but it was I who didn't. And in this trial, he makes us occupy the dock, the witness box, and the bench all at once. He always knew that my temple was a house of cards. And his only way of making me realize the fact was to knock it down. And that kind of sounds like God caused this pain to knock down these cards. But that's not what he meant if you read it. And I knew when God used that to speak to me, that's not what God meant when I read it. But what I learned is like through these times when we're waiting and it's hard and you don't understand, it's like the only thing, it's like you don't realize what you believe and the strength of what you believe until it's taken, until it's all knocked down. And it gets you to this posture where you're like, this is the most raw I can be. Like you've searched everything in my heart. And like my prayer was like, God, knock it down. Like I don't care how much more pain I have to go through, like knock it down. If there is anything in my heart that is like partnering with a lie. If there's any idol in my heart that I've put above you in my life, knock it down, expose it, do everything you can because like I want a life that's purely just unto you, purely unto you. And if I could get to a place where no matter what breakthrough comes or doesn't come, like I have Christ and he fulfills every part of me, that's a win. So um, I remember that week and Barry spoke on like the glory and the suffering of God. And I'm like, there's no way someone's speaking on this because God was just kind of, I felt like God was like, Trina, what if you're like trying so hard to get out of this and fix yourself? But what if I'm in this? Like, what if I'm inviting you into something with me? And I was like, really? 
dang, can't you invite me to something more fun, you know? <laughs> but it, I remember there was a song that Shane sent me after that preach from Barry, and it, and it a script, like a word, um, a verse said, I don't have to pretend that everything's okay. That's not what Jesus meant when he said, have faith. And I, that, like, I would just sit and listen to that song and cry for hours. And it, it's like in those moments, I realized that I had really started to feel ashamed and not love myself at all because I was like sad Trina and I was like grieving Trina. I was like, I don't like this person. And I thought that like maybe God didn't like me as much. Maybe God thought uh, she's in a process, but oh, eventually she'll get to the other side and have more faith and then maybe I can like use her again. I like that was just my mentality. I don't know if anyone's ever been there, but when you're going through hard things, it, it's sometimes hard to receive the love of God that he like actually is for you right in that moment. And so if, if you're going through that, you need to know like God's not trying to fix you. God's not trying to fix you. He just wants to love you. He just wants to hold you while you cry. He just wants to sit with you and comfort you and nurture you. And he will do it every single time as long as you need. And sometimes in the waiting, I don't know if you've experienced this, but it feels like he leads you to death. I know that sounds really extreme, but it's like death of that thing. Like death of the thing that's like, if you're gonna put that before me in any kind of way, it's gonna die. And um, there's like a giving up, a surrender that like I learned if you do that sooner, it brings you through quicker. <laughs> and um, I think Barry shared this, but it led me to Psalm 126. And that is a, another psalm that I've been feasting on. It's um, verse 5, those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. That's like a kingdom principle. That's like the word of God. It's a, it's a law. Thank you. That means like you get sowing, you get songs of joy when you reap tears. When you let yourself feel that thing that maybe you've tried to numb. Trust me, I've been there because it can feel like if I really go down that road, maybe I won't be able to come back out. God's going to bring you back out. God's going to bring you back out. Those who sow in tears will reap in joy. The Bible says those who mourn will be comforted. How do you get comforted when you mourn? He will do it. This, well, that's for another thing. I've also been, I've got all these books. This is a book by Jason and Chris Vallotton. It's about wholeness. But he talked about that parable, 126, about sowing uh, tears of joy. And he was talking about how it's, it's about a farmer that plants in the hard season, about the farmer that has a family that isn't able to feed his family. But he knows if he gives them the seed, instant, like we're so in a culture of like immediate gratification. Like that is just even more so now. I don't think it was like that back then. There wasn't all this stuff that was readily available. You had to wait. You had to persevere. You had to believe. And in that process, God was doing something that couldn't be done any other way. And so it talked about how when you sow the seeds in the hard season, you know you're going to reap life on the other end. You can see the vision of what you're going to reap, but you know it's not for now. You know it's for later. And he said, the reason the farmer was sowing seed with tears of joy was because as he planted the seed, he was seeing both his family's hunger and the crop that would break the poverty cycle. So it's like, no matter how many tears you sow, you know, this is a spiritual law, like, at some point, there's going to be a break, there's going to be a shift, and you're going to sow in joy. You're going to reap joy for what you sow. So the second thing I learned 
I'm like, oh my gosh, five minutes, I'll do it fast. These last ones are fast. It's just to recognize that when we're waiting, when you're waiting for breakthrough, it's actually an invitation from God to get to know him in a different way. It's an invitation to know a side of him that maybe you don't know. And I was thinking about in Romans 5, um, it says, verse 3. This is another one, kind of like James 1, but not only so, but we also rejoice in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. I don't know about y'all, but I kind of read through that. I'm like, yeah, okay, suffering will produce hope, you know? I don't really think about the perseverance part or the character part. It's really easy for me to skip over that. But in this last season, I was kind of wrestling, like, what does it mean to persevere? What does that actually look like? Like, the on-ramp from suffering to hope, how do you get there and what do you, what do you, what do, you do? How do you do it well? How do, how do you steward it well? Well, I learned that um, perseverance is key to establishing roots. And when you're persevering, you're like persistently believing or doing something despite difficulty or delay. Persistently going after it despite the difficulty. And that's when God does the building. That's how you get back to hope. Because in the perseverance and the waiting, when you keep going at it, there's something he's building in your root system, your belief that can't be built. Like you don't need perseverance when you have everything that you asked for. You know, you don't need hope when you already have everything that you've hoped for. You don't need faith whenever you have it all in front of you. And I, it was a season where I realized there's, there's something God's building in me right now. There's something God's building in you that it's strengthening this belief system and it can only be done through perseverance. It can only be done through sowing the seeds of difficult times. And then that's kind of how I feel like in James, he says, consider it joy. Because you're like, I know on the other side of this is going to be something really good. So I'm like trying to see what to skip. But I realized for me, he was building something like a belief system in me that nothing in the world could knock down, that no matter what came at me, it was, it's like, I don't know if you've, I don't know if you can relate to like the whole breakthrough and waiting thing. I don't, I hope this is for someone else in the room. I know it's for me. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Charity. It's like, um, when you're waiting on God, like to fulfill a promise over your life, and you feel like you're got so close to it. And then he's like, it's like, oh, okay, now not yet. Like I thought that was it, but not yet. And then like time goes by. And then there's another situation where you're like, oh, maybe this is it. Kind of like Abraham. Him, they're trying to figure it out, like in their own strength. Hagar, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe Sarah sleep with my slave. <laughs> maybe that will produce the promised child. You know, I mean. I love it because I'm like, Abraham, you just revealed our humanity. And I kind of love it because we've all done that. We've all tried in our own strength to bring about something. But I realize that every time I get so close and it doesn't happen, it like hurt more. And I think over the last couple months, it was like I got to that breaking point where I'm like, this is actually hurting in a deeper way than it ever has before because it kind of feels like I keep and then not yet, and then I keep having hope, and not yet, but I realized, like, in that, there's, like, a deeper, like, exposure of my heart. There's a deeper digging to find God, because, like, what I dug before didn't work. There's, like, a deeper, like, stretching, a deeper surrender, a deeper yielding to him, and in essence, like, a deeper finding him, because it's, it's, like, what worked last time doesn't work anymore. God, like, I need more. I need more of you. I need, I need you to help me be okay. Like, I don't know how to be okay now, but I need you to help me. I need you to 
like, I need to die so that everything that you have would be in me. And so it's not the most fun process, but it's a beautiful process. It's a beautiful process because I promise you, if you decide to really go this way with the Lord, he will meet you in that place every time, every time. And he'll show you his character. He'll show you these aspects of him every single time. And I found that in the midst of that, you get to a point where you're like, he's the prize. Like, he's it. Like, I don't need the thing that I thought I needed unless what you're needing is him and what you're praying for breakthrough is him. You're like, you're it, Jesus. Like, that thing that I thought I had to have to be okay, I realize I don't have to have it because you're everything to me. You're everything to me. And with Jesus, we have everything. Without Jesus, we have nothing. And that's worth everything. So, yeah, for time's sake, the next couple are, there comes to a point when he brings you out of that place of like, wow, I don't need that thing I thought I needed. I just need Jesus. He will never leave me. He'll never forsake me. I may be a hot mess, but he's the safest man with my heart because he's never going to leave. He's never going to be like, you're too much. He loves us. He loves you. He loves you so much. Um, there's a point where he's like, all right, now I want you to contend. Now I want you to know because that root system now is so strong and you know that you know that that's me and you know that you don't actually need that thing, but because I spoke that word over your life, I need you to use the word of God and your authority as a son or daughter of Christ and declare and decree that word over your life. It's time to contend. It's time to decree. And I did that, sorry, I'm pointing, <laughs> with like uh, scripture, with the word. A few months ago, if y'all didn't hear Barry talk, I'm, I'm referencing you a lot, Barry, but it's always so good. Um, he talked about crafted prayers. I would really encourage you to go back and listen to that because I did that. I don't know if y'all did that, but I wrote some crafted prayers and I got some scripture and I got the word of God and what he was saying about the area, like in the area that I needed a breakthrough, I was like, God, what are you saying? And one of the things that Barry said was, if God said it, it's not if it will happen, it's just a matter of time. And that stuck with me. Like, this is going to happen. Now that I've processed all this pain and grief and surrendered and become nothing so he can make me everything, um, I know this is going to happen because I know who this is God is. Who, like, I know this is God. And no matter what the enemy tries to do, it doesn't matter because I know that this is my, my dad. Like, I know what my dad said and it's gonna happen, and now I'm gonna fight. So I started, we can remember. So that's, when you're, when you're in that contending place, ask the Lord for scriptures. Ask the Lord, God, what are you speaking in this area of my life? What are your promises? What are your prophetic words or encouraging words? When people have spoken things over your life or seen giftings or callings in you, what are those things? These are the things that we use to fight. And then also finding friends, finding people. I have some dear friends in this room that I have called and cried and cried and cried. And when I'm like, I don't have an in me to believe, they're like, that's okay, Trina, because I do. Because I know what God has spoken over your life. So I'm going to believe for you when you don't have the strength to believe for yourself. Find that person. It can be one person. It can be a couple people. If you don't, or if you're like, oh, I wish I had that person, but I don't, ask, ask the Lord. The Lord will give you that person. So these are just some things I've learned in the waiting. Okay, it's only 7.15. Okay, I'm gonna read a scripture and then I have some testimonies and we're just gonna, we're just gonna take some time to encounter the Lord. I believe if you're in the room and you're like, I still have this thing that I've been waiting for and I don't actually feel very hopeful. 
I believe God's going to breathe hope into that thing, into that promise. If you're like, I just want more of God. I just want to encounter him because I want more. I believe God's going to touch you. I believe he's here and present to move. So Romans 4, 2 through 5, this is the last. I just love Abraham and just Romans and just all of it. It's like even though Abraham, you know, tried to do it his own way, man, he had faith. And that encourages me. Um, So verse 2, if in fact Abraham was justified by works, he is... He had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. This is kind of the verses I'm using to like decree and declare these promises over my life. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited to him as righteousness. Verse 18, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. Since he was, um, sorry, since he was about a hundred years old and Sarah's womb was also dead, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. Man, that gets me pumped up. That's like, God doesn't require our efforts. He requires our belief. God will bring the breakthrough. We just have to steward our heart against unbelief, against the pain, against the fence towards others, against the fence towards ourselves, against the fence towards God, against unbelief, against doubt, against sin. We steward our heart. God brings the breakthrough. So I just have a few testimonies of times where um, I put like little to no effort into getting the breakthrough and God just brought it because God does that. Like sometimes it's this process and he's doing something in our heart, but sometimes it's like you just show up and you're like, God, like I need you to touch me. And he's like, boop, okay. And so I have a few testimonies and as I share these testimonies, um, I just ask that you take them for yourself. Whatever it is that, that, that you're looking for God to do, When I went to BSSM, um, I had gotten accepted into the program, but then I, there were all these unknowns, like, I guess I need to quit my job. I need to like find a place to live. I need to pack up and move all the way to California. There were a lot of scary things. And one of the things that God did was he brought along this person that gave me $17,000 to go to school. And the crazy thing is, I didn't even ask for money. I didn't even ask for the breakthrough. I just knew I applied and I knew God told me to go. And then God just brought this person that's like, hey, I want to help you go. And I'm like, why? I didn't do anything. God brought it forth. God brought the breakthrough. When I was in third year, When I was in first year, my pastor, her name was Angela. She was this incredible woman that I wanted to learn from. And in your third year of school, you get to intern for another pastor in any part of the school or the church. Well, I really wanted to intern for Angela, but I didn't know how to go about that. And so I asked one of her interns, Cheryl, like, how did you become an intern for Angela? And she was like, well, you don't really apply or ask. You just get asked. And I was like, oh, okay. (laughs) So I just kind of like kept it in my heart, like, God, I really want to intern for Angela. I didn't do anything to make it happen. I just believed in my heart. And then on graduation day of third year, Angela hugs me and she whispers in my ear, Trina, I want you to know if you want to do third year, that there's a spot for you on my team. And I'm like, oh my gosh. 
Like sometimes God just does it and we literally don't have to do anything. Like I shared this testimony a few weeks ago of this job just kind of dropped in my lap after Valerie had prayed for breakthrough and I didn't do anything to even find it. It was just like, here you go. So I'm saying this to encourage you. I believe tonight God is like, here you go. For those that want it, for those that are hungry, for those that want to be touched by him, I believe he's going he's gonna to move. So I'm going to have Valerie come up because I feel like I'm low on time. And we're just going to, we're going to go after that. Um, as she's coming up, we're going to have some time where we pray for people, anyone that wants prayer. But if there's some music that we could put on, um, but there's just a few questions and maybe these are questions you write down and talk to the Lord about later, or maybe it's ones you process with him now. But I just encourage you when you go home to ask the Lord, like, where have you been in the waiting? Where have you been in the waiting? And then, God, what are you showing me about who you are? What is the new facet of, of your character that you want to show me in the waiting? How do you want to reveal yourself in a new or different way to me? as I'm waiting. And then God, what root are you strengthening? Like as I sow these seeds, what are you building in me? What are you doing in my heart? <laughs> 